currently in the country we can screen for four types of cancer breast cancer cervical cancer prostate cancer colon cancer all the other cancers that i haven't mentioned do not have effective screening methods and not only in this country in many parts of the world having said that if you have a family history of cancer you actually need individualized screening so you actually need to go and see your doctor because you might need to be checked for more than just those four Hello and welcome to Riverdale Medical Center. I'm Sheila Bett and today I'll be sitting with cancer specialist Dr. Andrew Odiambo. We'll basically try to understand cancer because we've all heard about it, but there's a lot of misconception around what it is, what it means, what are the dangers once you're diagnosed with cancer, what, you, what do you need to do? So I'm going to be asking Dr. Andrew Odiambo all these questions and we'll start with the most basic one. What is cancer? Uh, thanks Sheila for, for asking me to come here. Um, that's a very interesting question, what is cancer? Most of the time I don't know what to say because there's a lot to say. Cancer isn't one disease, but just to understand what it is, it's, it's when a part of your body, I use the example of breast cancer maybe, um, when you have cells that are growing abnormally without the normal body mechanisms to stop them from growing, they, they can grow and grow and become bigger and actually form the actual lump which then becomes cancer. So the same thing can take place in the stomach or in the intestines or in your brain. So basically cancer is just uncontrolled growth and dividing of cells which is usually abnormal. So what causes that abnormal growth of cells and are there different kinds of abnormal growths besides cancer? Cancer is not one disease. It can occur in literally any part of your body apart from your hair probably. Um, and so if you have those abnormal growths in any of those places, then that is called cancer. But generally we group cancers into cancers of solid organs, like breast cancer, maybe cervical cancer. And then you have cancers of the blood system, which affects, you know, like the leukemia that you may have heard of maybe on TV, which affects the blood system, which are slightly different and that treated slightly different from the normal cancers that affect the solid um, organs. What causes it? Um, the causes are many. Majority of the time we don't know what causes cancer. You just wake up one morning and it's knocking on your door. But we have what we call risk factors. Some of them could be genetic that you're born with. Some of them you can acquire, you know, during your, when you're growing up during life. Um, so having a family member with cancer, especially like breast cancer, colon cancer, may, may put you at risk of developing that specific type of cancer much later although it's not necessarily the case. Um, and then when you look at the acquired risk factors, um, you know, exposure to tobacco, harmful use of alcohol, obesity, exposure to certain viruses like HPV virus, hepatitis virus, HIV, maybe exposure to radiation or excessive radiation has been thought to cause cancer. There's a very interesting new concept we're trying to look into, and this is in the agrochemicals and pesticides and things that are in our food, which we are still beginning to learn more about whether some of those preservatives can actually cause uh, cancer. So there are obviously a lot of myths surrounding it because it's this enema and nobody really understands how it works. Um, and the people who believe that if you get surgery once you're diagnosed with cancer, that that can lead to a spread. Is that true? I'm going to say no, it's not true because surgery that's done well with well-experienced hands does not result in the spreading of that cancer. However, having said that, if you have uh, a substandard surgery or a very olden type of surgery where the techniques are not good, you don't have the correct equipment to take very small uh, pieces of, of the cancer to make a diagnosis, which we call a biopsy, then there's theoretically a risk that trying to cut it open as they used to do uh, in the 19th century and way before might actually lead to the spread and that's where that rumor actually came from. What about sugar intake once you have been diagnosed with cancer? Is it um, advice that you stop taking sugar? Is that any, in any way something that can cause the cancer to spread or to get worse? Stopping sugar 
will not make the cancer stop growing and eating sugar will not make the cancer grow faster. If you stop taking sugar, your body will have other ways of getting sugar. It will change your muscle or your fat into sugar and continue to grow. So telling somebody to stop eating sugar that the cancer will grow is actually not true. Eating sugar can cause obesity which can lead to cancer. Are there any dietary um, ad advice that you give to people when they have cancer? There's a lot about nutrition and cancer and I happen to be one of the most liberal oncologists around. Mm -hmm. I allow my patients to misbehave and do things that uh, traditional doctors wouldn't allow. And more so, it's because I want them to have a near normal life as possible. Some people tell me, you know, now I was given my own spoon, my own plate, I can't eat this, I can't eat that. No, a cancer patient can eat the same food that any other normal person eats, so long as it's healthy food. I'm not saying that you go and eat burgers and fries and ice cream every day. That's bad for everyone, you know. So long as you're eating a healthy diet with enough carbohydrates, um, the correct portion, enough protein, um, quite a big chunk of vegetables and fruits so that you're getting a well-balanced meal, which is the same recommendation we give to everyone. It should be the same recommendation for a cancer patient. The only difference probably is on patients, patients who are receiving chemotherapy, for example, and are at a high risk, risk of uh, getting a low immunity. We sometimes tell them to make sure their food is clean and properly washed, and if they have to eat anything that's coming from underneath the ground, they have to take the peels off so that they don't expose themselves to germs, you know. No eating raw foods and things that have been cooked only for a minute, no rare things, so that you reduce the risk of infection. But you can eat just the same food as, 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 as anybody else. If once in a while you want to have an ice cream, there's actually nothing wrong, but don't overdo you know, the things that we know that mm. are not good. So speaking of chemotherapy, there's so many ideas that people have about it and one of the major ones is to do with hair loss. Um, do all forms, is there, are there different kinds of chemotherapy first and then do all forms of chemo chemotherapy lead to uh, loss of hair and maybe even death in certain cases? Some chemotherapies will cause hair loss. Some cause complete hair loss. Some only cause, cause thinning and maybe whitening of the hair. Some chemotherapies do not cause hair loss at all. For example, most of the common chemos we use for colon cancer, for example, do not cause hair loss. But many people, they don't know that and they might make their decision based on that myth and deny themselves life-saving treatment because of something they don't understand. Some chemos cause a lot of skin changes, blackening, darkening of the hands and feet. But this is, these are things you should discuss with, with your doctor before starting treatment mm. during the consent pro, uh, process so that you understand what you're getting into. So saying blindly that all chemo causes hair loss is actually not true. Some do and some don't. Okay. So many people who have a fear of getting cancer and have heard stories including someone getting a mastectomy even before diagnosis just because they thought they were predisposed to getting uh, cancer. Is it true that family history equals getting cancer or does that vary? If, if you look at all the cancers that are available now or, the, or that exist, maybe between 5 and 10% will, be, will have a link within the family. If you take 100 cases of breast cancer women, probably only 10 of, the, of them will have gotten it because somebody in their family also had it before. Majority of the cancers just appear from nowhere. In the medical terms, we call it sporadic. So it just, one day you just woke up and you had cancer. None in your family has cancer. No grandfather with cancer, no grandmother, no uncles, no nothing, but you have cancer. But the fact that you have it, now your siblings and your children probably need to be screened maybe earlier mm. because there's always a time for something to start. We don't always have to rely on the history from from our grandparents, mm. but it's good that if you have a family member with cancer, use that opportunity to go for early screening okay. and early detection. 
Thank you so much for coming and all the questions that you've answered. Um, I hope you've gained more knowledge on cancer and that you're even more curious to now go and learn more about it. As Dr. Odiambo explained, it's really good to constantly be aware of what, because there's new knowledge often, and to just constantly be aware of what the new information is and just have the right information rather than misleading information.